So this video is a little different. Um, today I had an opportunity to talk to Naveen Reddy. Uh, Naveen is a fairly prolific and popular content creator on YouTube who makes Java tutorial videos. He manages and leads a YouTube channel called Telesco, which you might have heard and the videos you might have seen. Uh, he has a lot of good content on Java and uh, blockchain is something that he's working on. I had an opportunity to talk to him today. So before the interview, I told him, I don't know if this is gonna be beneficial to any of my viewers, but as a fellow content creator, these are the things that I wanna to talk to you about. So uh, Naveen was gracious enough to talk to me and uh, answer some of my questions. This conversation added a lot of value to me. Uh, I've shared this in case it adds value to you. Uh, Naveen shares some of his thoughts about uh, software development in general, uh, specifically for people who are fresh out of college and getting into the industry. Naveen lives in India and he's kind of familiar with the pulse of uh, the job market there, the freshers getting into the software industry and all that stuff. So ask him some questions specifically about the job market and the software industry in India. So if you are in India, that aspect of this interview will hopefully be beneficial uh, and provide some insights to you. So in general, I really enjoyed this conversation talking to a fellow content creator on YouTube and I hope you like it as well. I want to start off by kind of learning a little bit about uh, about you. Uh, I have seen the Naveen Reddy on uh, Telesco YouTube channel, but I want a little bit mm. of a background. Like, what where, where are you from? What is your journey to kind of get into this world of uh, teaching and computer science and programming and Java and all that stuff? So I started my career when I completed my master's in IT. Uh, I wanted to be a developer. I also wanted to be a trainer, not as a trainer, but you know, when in colleges, when I used to uh, give seminars and then work, and I used to take presentations, I used to feel very happy. I don't know why, but uh, it used to give me some positive impact. Yeah, so this is something I love. But on the other hand, I wanted to be a developer as well because I was good with Java. Uh, I mean, kind of compared to my uh, college mates, that's maybe I was overconfident. Uh, so when I joined uh, my first job, uh, it was tricky because you know I joined a service-based company in India, and uh, you, as you know, that what happens in service-based companies. Uh, so I wanted to get a Java project. I wanted to get up at least one project where I can show showcase my development skills. But unfortunately, I got into a project where I was not able to showcase my skill set. And then every day or every weekend, I used to talk to my manager by saying, hey, I want to shift to a different project where I can uh, showcase my skills. And uh, you know they were like, okay, wait for six months, you know, complete your this period so that we can shift to a new, new project. I was like, okay, let me try. And then there was a point I felt, you know, I'm losing my track because that's what happened when you, as a developer, when you don't get to work on the projects, you will lose that charm. Absolutely, uh, yeah. And, so maybe after three months, I felt that thing in me. Okay, so I'm losing my charm. Let me just change my company. So I left that company. I was I have signed a bond of two years, but still, uh, my for me, my career was more, more important than those uh, that signed bond. Right. I left that job. I joined a startup, and that's where I rea realized that you know a development gives. I mean, when I work on the project, it I used to feel very happy. I used to get excited while working and we all know that when you deploy the project for the first time, the enterprise project, uh, we, we are on different level. Uh, and at the same time, I got an opportunity to train my juniors. Uh, so when they join a company, uh, so I was responsible to uh, teach them or you know, giving them the previous knowledge, what, ha what happened with the project and what we're going to do. And they used to like my teaching uh, and that's when I got the confidence, okay, so this is something I can do in my, in, in my future. And I got the opportunity to train in different companies as well uh, through my manager. So he he told me, okay, there's, a, there's another company of his friend. Uh, they also need someone who can you know help their their juniors or joinees. And I went there. I gave my first training, and then day by day, I, I was I was able to take more trainings. And there was a point I felt it's time to start my own business. Okay. Uh, not exact business per se because I'm not a business person. I'm not into money making business, but it was more of uh, doing something of my own. Uh, I was thinking about joining, I mean, opening my own classes, own institute, but that is something I can't able to manage it's because it's a big uh, logistic issues. On the other hand, I was thinking about, uh, uh, you know, do giving corporate trainings because it's a different feel, you know, when you go to a big company and give a training to new joinees, uh, they're excited. 
you are excited, so everything goes well. And I started with that. I went to different companies as for as a trainer, and there was a point where uh, I was giving a training to one of the company, and at the same time there were two classrooms. I was in one classroom, and then the other the other classroom had a different trainer, and we we have been instructed not to teach anything extra. So it, it was a service-based company again, and. Uh, how do you define what extra? Is it's not like you have a syllabus of any sort, right? Like what, we what had, is extra? We had, like? unfortunately, unfortunately, we had a syllabus uh, oh, incorporating as well. Uh, yeah. so, <laughs> okay. So it was a Java, Java, uh, Java course, mode mm -hmm. of uh, Spring, Hibernate, and uh, so those things. And they have given us all the PPTs and uh, the exact content. And we were not supposed to do anything extra, just teach the thing which is there in the PPTs and in the content. I was doing that, I, you know, controlling my emotions because as a trainer, it's always difficult to control our emotions because there might be different questions from the audience. And uh, right. unfortunately, one day, one of the uh, participant asked me a question which was not part of a syllabus. I was like, okay, uh, uh, let, let me just skip, that skip this question. But then later I felt bad about this. How can I skip a question? I'm a, I'm a trainer. I'm responsible to, to, you know, to answer all the questions. And then in the break time, I mean, before the break, I answered that question, but again, I was in the, I was in the flow. Instead of just answering the question, I also talked about something else. And uh, during the break, both this classroom merged in the cafeteria, and they were discussing about, hey, you know, Navin has talked about these things, and uh, so this this matter escalated to the manager, and then uh, the supervisor he came to me and said, hey, you're not supposed to talk anything extra. I said, okay, I'm sorry, I will try my best to do that, and that's where I felt, you know, as a trainer. No one should be controlling you. You, if you want to teach something, it should be open for you. And that's when I thought, let's start with YouTube because no one can control you on YouTube. So if you want to share something, you have the audience, just share. People who love you, they will watch your content. Otherwise, there are trollers, they will not watch your contents and that's fine. They will give you a view. Uh, I started with YouTube and then every day I used to think, okay, this is something I know, let me publish a video. This is something I know, let me publish a video. Or this is something I don't know, let me learn and publish a video. So that's how I started and uh, <clears throat> moving. Parallelly, I was doing pro projects as well. And now at this point, uh, I'm moving from projects and corporate training more towards online content because I felt there's so much of need for online content, uh, especially for new technologies like blockchain, because it's, it's, you know, it's been 10 years for blockchain in the industry and other countries, they are able to adapt to this technology, but not in India. In, especially in India, we have this issue of, uh, you know, if you go to some areas, they will teach you blockchain for 5,000 rupees. Uh, so, <laughs> I, I don't know if you know that area name, but it's very famous in uh, in India. Uh, you heard about Amir Pate, right? I have heard, yes. I don't know where yeah, it is so just though, but to, yeah, okay. It's in okay. Hyderabad, uh, it's in Hyderabad. Okay. You just go to that area and you will, you will find a board, you know, yeah. learn blockchain in 5,000 rupees. Okay. Uh, so this I, is, this I have is something definitely that's heard the name Amir Pate before. Is it is it like a a city or is it more of like an urban area? Um, uh, so in in Hyderabad there are different. Uh, it's a small place in Hyderabad uh, mm -hmm. where they have a lot of institutes, coaching institutes. Have, have you heard about Durga Soft or Nadesh IT by any chance? I've heard of Durga Soft, but not the other one. Um, yeah. So the entire lane. So the entire lane is of classes. Okay. So they have Durga Soft. They have Nadesh IT. So I got the opportunity to go there. I mean, just to visit that area, just to uh -huh. see how things are there. Uh, I've talked to some of these students there, and then they were, some people were happy that they have joined these big institutes, and some of them were very sad that they, I mean, I mean, there are some negative sides of that as well. Maybe we can okay. take that in some other uh, calls. Yeah. Is, is the training good, though, or not? Uh, some trainers are great. Uh, okay. Some of them, they are just making money there. See, that's the thing and with these funny. big institutes, right? It's It really depends on the trainer that you get. You have all these big yeah. institutes promising, like, okay, we're going to teach you with this X, Y, and Z. But then mm -hmm. when you go join it, it's like you have, they have 10 people in the staff teaching and whoever you yeah. have the fortune or misfortune to get as a teacher, your whole experience kind of depends on that. So that's like, yeah, yeah, it's tricky. And if you're not fortunate, you might be getting a trainer who will demotivate you more than uh, <laughs> motivating you. So. Yeah, yeah. That's However, the the story that you talked about, like your your whole journey, right? The kind of like the story of your journey. It it a lot of things that you mentioned kind of resonates with me. There are some oh, similarities with 
the way I kind of got into it as well. And I totally agree with your uh, kind of like I understand your sentiment of being controlled when you teach. Because in my opinion, and let me know what you think, I feel like teaching is more of a creative endeavor. It's not something yeah. that you do like, uh, for for example, for um, let's say let's say coding for example, right? When you code, mm. you have this one aspect of it, like okay, you got to make this program work, and then there is a second yeah. aspect of it, which is the creative part, which is I'm not just writing code to get the result that I want. I'm writing code mm. which is elegant, which is maintainable, mm. which is readable, which is kind of yeah. like a joy to read and maintain, right? So there's a creative part to it. I think that is true for teaching as well. So if you have like a syllabus and say, okay, you got to do just this, you're not mm. just, you know, restricting the teacher, you're limiting the creative potential. And so you're, uh, the teacher is not able to read the room, like you said, and they can't say, okay, yeah. like this room has this question. Let me answer this one question and that'll make whatever is in the syllabus make more sense, mm-hmm. even if that is not in yeah. the syllabus, right? It's like, it's all tied together. Knowledge is a network. That's, that's so you can't right. draw a strict boundary and have those limitations. So yeah, I definitely, yeah. definitely kind of uh, understand what you mean when you said that. So um, let me ask you about your corporate training experience. So when, when you say you're, you did corporate training, or are you still doing corporate training? I still do, but then the number of trainings I take now is, I mean, so let's say uh, in the earlier days of my career, I used to take around uh, 10 to 15 trainings per year. Now I take only one or two. Uh, that also depends upon company. Uh, so I want to skip that because when I go to corporate training, I can't actually focus on my YouTube work or online content mm-hmm. because there's a gap. So, so let's say uh, in the month of July, I went for a training. And uh, so it's a training of one month. So when I go there, I can't actually touch my YouTube because I have to be there from nine to nine or nine to uh, nine to seven, and even if before the training, I have to prepare because you can't simply go there and uh, take a session. Of course, you have to check mark some things. Okay, there's something I have to talk about, and uh, I can't touch YouTube for one month, and that's where the issue starts. Because when I come back, uh, I lost my momentum, and uh, it take around one week for me just to get into that momentum again to make videos and to prepare my own content. Uh, maybe it's just me or it happens with everyone. Uh, you know, I lose everything. So uh, that, maybe there's oh a, there's man, a short term. That totally loss with happens me. with me. That totally happens with me. You know what happens with me? It's like when I'm making content, right? I try to batch them together because when I, let's say I, I have plans for like, I don't know, like an hour of content. Okay. So I batch them together because the first 15 to 20 minutes of me trying to teach something to a camera, it's crap. It doesn't come good yeah. at all, right? After 15, 20 minutes to half an hour, that's when I kind of hit my stride and like, okay, now what I'm saying might make sense to whoever is listening and I'm yeah. just speaking gibberish. So there is totally this thing called momentum, not just in terms of how many, you know, like four or five days working together, but even in a single mm-hmm. day, I feel like there is momentum in like, you know, if you spend two hours working on content together versus spending like five minutes recording something, another five minutes recording something else, it's never going to turn out well for me. That's right. That's right. Cool. Cool. So, but, but why so would that's you... why I'm trying to skip. Uh, Sorry, go ahead. That's why I'm trying to reduce the number of uh, training I take. Mm-hmm. So I only work with those companies now, which where uh, we have a good uh, you know, rapport. So in fact, I, I also say no to them sometimes, but you know they have this uh, thing. They don't want to take as risk with new trainer. So <laughs> okay. <laughs> How do you find the, the the restrictions in corporate training? Do they have a syllabus as well? Can you go out of syllabus there? Uh, some company, yes. In fact, when I go for a training where you have multiple classrooms, so at the same time, they have uh, three to four uh, batches running together and they have to follow syllabus. Mm. Uh, if I go to a company where, I mean, basically a product-based companies where they don't have a syllabus, they just say, hey, this is a batch. They don't know Spring Framework. They don't know, let's say, uh, blockchain. Take a training. And it's it's dependent upon me how I want to start. They will give me 10 days, 15 days, or maybe 20 days. In fact, they also ask me how many days you need. And then they also negotiate. Okay, so if I say twenty days, they will say, "Okay, uh, can you do that in fifteen days?" Mm-hmm. If I say, then I have to plan my curriculum or my, you know, flow based on what number of days they give. And it also depends upon the background of the audience. Uh, so let's say they already are, they already have worked on some projects on some different frameworks, and now they want to sh- switch to Spring. Uh, so again, it, the flow changes. So mm-hmm. they don't know anything how to. I take, take a training, so they give me all the liberty, do whatever you want, but at the end of this training, they should be able to work on a project. Hmm. And 
I do it that way. And I enjoy, I enjoy this type of trainings. It's risky because uh, you're, even, you're not sure. It's your content. Yeah. Uh, you're not sure the background and what project they're going to work on. But still, you yeah. have to. And of course, I change my curriculum in between as well. So let's say after five days, I realize, hey, this is something's not working. Uh-huh. Let me change the flow. Uh, so we do that. Maybe some audience get to know it. OK, they are like, oh, something has changed. And some people are going to go enough flow. Okay. Oh, this is what we are going to learn today. That's great. Okay. So I enter the summer trainings where I get the opportunity to have my own uh, curriculum. So between corporate trainings and making YouTube content, what do you prefer? YouTube is uh, what I read from what you're saying so far. <laughs> but is that true? Uh, it actually depends. You know, uh, when I take classroom training, I enjoy a lot because that's where you get to do interaction with audience. In, on YouTube, yes, it's a great platform. Uh, but then when you make a content, when you prepare a content, you are actually talking to a camera. And I mean, of course, you have this experience. It's damn weird. Yeah. Uh, I mean, of course, after f- five to six years, I get I got to used to it, looking at a camera. But it's weird. Still now, when I make a video, I don't know how they will react. Because in a classroom, when you talk about something, you can see the reactions. Okay, this is what they're, they're getting. This is what they're understanding. Or maybe if they are getting confused, they will get. They will tell you by the expressions. You can't do that on camera. You don't even know what your teaching is making sense to them. And after uploading a video, we have to wait for one hour just to understand. Hey, okay. So you know, based on the number of likes, dislikes you get, or maybe based based on the comments you get. Uh, so if if someone is saying, hey, this was confusing, and it happens with me at, at, at this point as well. When I make a video, there's still a question mark. Will they understand what I'm talking about? Mm-hmm. So yeah, no, I, I totally agree. Uh, it took me a long time to get used to showing myself on camera. A lot of the initial uh, videos yeah. I was doing was just screen recording. It's a That's little right. easier to do screen recording than talking to a camera. It's it's hard for people to understand how difficult it is if they haven't done this before. It seems natural yeah. when you see the finished product, but if someone has not done uh, just talking to the camera style of a video, it's super embarrassing. I totally see what you mean. The other problem with YouTube videos that I found is that you get people from various different levels who are accessing mm-hmm. that video or who are watching that video. You might you might get like, yeah. let's say you make a video on a spring framework, a topic on a mm-hmm. spring framework, right? You might get yeah. someone who is totally new to spring. You might get someone who yeah. has some knowledge of spring and they, you know, they want to learn this other thing. You might get someone who has yeah. some previous experience who has gone to one of those uh, trainings for paying five thousand dollars for uh, five thousand rupees for the Spring uh, Framework course and <laughs> trying to get more information. So it's like you have people with various different levels, and yeah. when you're creating content, it's hard to tailor it so that it appeals to all of them, right? So you need to, you need to address some level there. You need to assume some level and create content. Yeah. For them. That's what I find super difficult every time I make content. Uh, but yeah. yeah, in fact, when I was making videos for Java or Python, in fact, Python series, one of the uh, most viewed view- uh, series on YouTube. Uh, so when I was making those that that course, it was not something I planned to make a video for Python. It was more of the uh, demand from the audience. So they were like, okay, you have made Java videos now. We want Python from your side. I was like, okay, I'm not into Python development, but still, I thought uh, once you know Java, you can actually learn any language in one week. Uh, so I learned Python. I made some projects and start making series. Uh, so when I started making series. I, it was difficult for me to understand who will be watching these videos. Will it be uh, a corporate people who will be watching this, or maybe students who into who are into machine learning and they have a prerequisite of learning Python, or school students? In fact, I was not knowing about this, but in schools now they are teaching Python, and it turned out that most of the views which I'm getting is from is from schools, and uh, that's where I have to change my, you know, after making 10 to 15 videos, then I realize, hey, I have to think about all the levels now. It's not just about those people who are into machine learning or they are working on Python. I have to also focus on those students who are into schools now. Okay, so, that's 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 interesting. That's, I didn't know that. So you're, um, you kind of got into Python uh, content creation as a result of people asking for content. Yeah. Uh, is this something you look at, like you know, see what is the what is the demand? Uh, pay attention to the likes and the dislikes. If somebody says, "Okay, this this video sucks" or something like that, do you do you go examine the video and say, "Okay, is this is this really bad" or something like that? Like, what's your process? 
behind getting that feedback? Uh, in terms of, okay, there, there are two things. One is, uh, so when I, when I make a video, I have to understand two things. One is the, uh, is will this video get views? I mean, that's something I used to think about before, but now uh, I don't think about views because I have learned something. When you make a video, initially you will not get views, uh, especially the type of videos, content which we create. Example, your video, which is about Spring OAuth. Now, even if you get, let's say, 1,000 views or 2,000 views now, that doesn't matter because in future, all these videos will get a search view. So that when, when they search about Spring OAuth, your video will pop up and you will get views. We are not someone who uh, create edu uh, entertainment content which people will watch once and they will go away. Yeah. Uh, so now I don't think about views. I just make videos and uh, let's see. If, even if I get a views, that's great. Otherwise, let's wait and watch. The other aspect, which is if I make a video, I'm, as, as, we, uh, as I mentioned before, I have to understand if I'm making a video, is it making sense to an audience? And yes, I, do check the like. I, I used to feel bad about dislikes before. You know, I want my videos to have minimum dislikes. But then there was there was a period of my, I mean, last to last, in 2017 somewhere, every time I used to upload a video, I used to get more dislike than likes in first five minutes. So maybe I used to get three likes and 10 dislikes. I used to get confused why these dislikes. And then I realized there's a, there's a concept of trollers, that, that there's a concept of spammers, haters, so maybe they have created multiple channels or accounts just to dislike the videos. I don't uh, but get then that. it stopped now. Why why would someone do that? I don't get it. I don't know. I don't know. So But uh, now it's not happening at least. Yeah. So things are going good. I honestly don't understand why someone would would have uh, maybe dislikes make sense if they actually encounter the video and they don't like it. Then yeah. you know I'm open to people dislike. That's the whole reason why the dislike button exists. But why would That's right. why would people kind of systematically dislike all videos? I don't get that. But yeah, anyway, it's um, maybe maybe there. I don't know. I I do I do see some some dislikes uh, in the first few minutes of some of my videos. Right, I upload a video. Yeah. The first few minutes, I it's like I know you haven't seen this video because this video is fifteen minutes long. <laughs> And it hasn't been 15 yeah. minutes since I uploaded it. How can you possibly either like or dislike this video? I don't get it. But anyway, people do what they want to do. There's something like, okay, so we got a new video from Telisco. It must be bad. Just <laughs> like it. <laughs> oh, well. yeah. So, mm. Cool. So um, the, the other thing, so going back to the uh, corporate training versus uh, YouTube video uh, concept yeah. that we were talking about. Uh, this is a struggle that I've been having. Um, I used to create videos in a course format. Okay, so basically okay. I take a topic and then I say, okay, uh -huh. I need to make around like 15 to 20 videos so that I cover this topic in depth. And it has this nice progression, right? First topic, first video is an introduction. Second video, I talk a little yeah. bit more hands-on, you know, building a project in entirety to a finished, mm -hmm. quote-unquote, finished stage. Yeah. Uh, but the trend today seems to be on YouTube to create these short videos which are standalone and then you just yeah. watch for like five minutes and then you get something out of it and then you're done. What are your thoughts yeah. about that? Are you, is that something that you would consider doing? Is that something you're already doing by the way? Uh, what are your thoughts uh, about that? Okay, now this is something I even have seen. Uh, so I remember you when, I, when you uploaded Java 9 videos, that's somewhere you, so that, that was the first time you showed your face, right? On screen? Java I think 9? it was, no, it was, it was a bit while back. I think it was uh, Jack Saris. Oh, okay, Yeah, so, I've, so, I've been showing myself on and off, so not too often, <laughs> but yeah. So when you uploaded Java 9, maybe there was some series which you uploaded mm -hmm. all the videos at the same time. Yes. So around in the duration of two days, you have uploaded all the videos, uh -huh. right? Uh, that's a course content. So in fact, I used to think about those things. So let's say if I make a want to course on, uh, let's say maybe Java again. Uh, so there's one way you can make a series the way you have on Udemy or on different platforms. You can, uh, you know, you can have all the videos there, and all these videos are dependent on each other. So maybe if you want to watch the first first fifth video, uh, you have to make sure that you have watched the fourth video. Right. So it creates a dependency, and it makes sense to have those dependencies in a platform where. I mean, platform like Udemy, or if you have your own platform, example, I have my own platform, which is telescope.com. Right. 
which is a paid, which where I have some paid courses. In fact, now it's only two. So if you buy a course, of course, you know that you have to watch all the videos, then it will make mm -hmm. sense. But YouTube is a bit different now. Uh, YouTube is more of people do search your videos, right? Example, let's say they want to know about how uh, polymorphism works. So they will not search for Java tutorials. They will search for polymorphism. And then if they want to watch your video, it should not be dependent on the previous video. Right. Now, luckily, what happened with me is when I started my uh, YouTube thing, I have never thought about making the entire course. My main motto was to make videos. So I, I created some videos like what is polymorphism, what is uh, encapsulation. There was never there was never a, a thing. Uh, uh, what do you say? Uh, a plan to make the entire course. Then I realized people don't search for Java course. They search for some concept. Maybe they are they are learning Java from somewhere, and then uh, in the classroom, let's say they joined some institute, and then they were not able to understand polymorphism. Mm -hmm. They will go to YouTube. They will search for the top particular topic. And and that's why it makes sense to have a video which is standalone. So they don't they, this this should not be a dependency on the previous video. But yes, you can you can still say, hey, once you have watched this video, now wait for the next video where we'll think about some advanced things. Yeah. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Um, I don't know if you can see me, Naveen, but I have lost your video. Yeah, there was a loss, yeah. Okay, here you're back. Now you're back. Yeah. So I have been doing this thing called uh, brain bites. Uh, you know, yeah. Java brains, brain bites. So it's basically short yeah. videos. I'm kind of trying that format. So it's it's always tricky when you want to cover some advanced topics. You know, you don't want to start from the beginning every video you create. So yeah. that's a that's, that's pretty tricky. But anyway, um, I mean, why don't you try some other platforms? I mean, just want to know your thing. Ah, yeah, I I've, I've thought about it. How how does Udemy worked out for you? Which platform do you do? Udemy, Udemy Udacity. Uh, so I want I wanted to go on uh, plural site before, but then they have a lot of restrictions. Uh, see, if you are a developer and if you are not, on, I mean, at least if you're not on YouTube, plural site and all this platform makes sense because uh, they want your course to be published only on that platform. But that's not the case with Udemy, or that's not the case with YouTube. So it's open platform, right? Now, in terms of Udemy, Udemy is good, uh, but re revenue-wise is not that great because they have different offers which is running. And uh, and one thing I realized about Udemy uh, is, to I mean, if someone if you want someone to buy your course, you need to have uh, good reviews, and that, that reviews most of the time is fake. Uh, people buy reviews. In fact, I got some of the mails from some companies. They saw my course on Udemy and I got a mail that, do you want to increase your reviews or oh, ratings? I was like, <laughs> like okay. Uh, so I, I have not went for that, but yeah. it's tricky, right? I mean, you can get a review by just by paying and then you're basically fooling people that you have a course which is great. Uh, so Udemy is good, but not in terms of, not compared to other platforms. So it was just an experiment for me just to see how Udemy will work out. But now I, I want to focus more on my own platform. And that makes sense for YouTubers because they are already famous, right? They People do follow them, people know them. You know, if, you, if there's a course from Java Prince, of course it will be great. Then why do you even check for the reviews? Right? That's so true. I, 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 feel like, I, I feel like for platforms like Udemy and Udacity, th the value add that they bring is a distribution. They get your content and yeah. you know, kind of give it to people who are looking for it. So if someone That's does not have that branding, who doesn't have followers like you know the YouTube, you know people like you said, uh, it makes sense for them to use those platforms to reach out to people. But yeah. for someone who already has uh, subscribers on YouTube, who ha who you know people know their content, I feel like yeah. if you were to go to Udacity or Udemy, you're probably gonna give do them a favor more than they would be doing you a favor by you know putting the content That's in front right. of people. So I think, I think, you know, if you put your content there, I think they should be paying you more than they're probably paying you now is what I believe. <laughs> because because uh, you're bringing people with, to them. Uh, yeah, this is what happened with Python series. So last week I, I published a Python course on Udemy, the same course which is available on YouTube. The problem is in some of the companies, uh, YouTube is blocked. Ah, and okay. So they can't watch my videos. So what I did, I uploaded the same course on Udemy, but paid course. Same content, which is there on YouTube for free, but it will be paid on Udemy. Uh, 
Now the idea is every, every everyone can watch it. Now I wanted everyone to know about that course. What I did, I shared that link on my YouTube, and now I got around more than two thousand enrollment. So okay. wow. again, I'm promoting Udemy on YouTube now. So that's what happened. <laughs> yeah, it's like it's like you're doing more work for them than they are for you. But anyway, yeah. it seems strange that people are um, uh, paying money to watch content that's for free. You know what I found really, really <laughs> weird? There were a few yeah. uh, illegal download sites where my content mm -hmm. was uploaded. Oh, okay. and I don't even have a paywall, right? There were there were torrents and illegal downloads where they had taken all mm -hmm. of my spring content and they, you know, it's like uh, where they share a lot of other paid content as well. Uh, someone told okay. me that I checked it out. They they have published all my content for download. <laughs> like, man, what are you doing? This is available literally for free. <laughs> Why would you want to yeah. make it, package it illegally and upload it? It doesn't make sense. Anyway, um, I wanted to ask you about, um, you know, speaking of this kind of like this thread of videos that people need to watch, right? For, so let's say when you create a course on Python or anything else mm -hmm. for that matter, I know that different people drop off at different times, right? So let's say you have a yeah. course which is uh, 15 videos long or 20 videos long. Some people watch mm -hmm. all the 20 videos. Some people watch... Yeah. 10, 15, some people just watch two, three and drop off. What has yeah. your experience been with drop off? Is that something you think about? Uh, do you plan your course so that you kind of try and carry the viewers through to the end? Or is it something that, you know, you've accepted as, okay, this is a fact of life. There's nothing can be done about it. Uh, maybe this is something to do with YouTube. <laughs> so, I mean, see, I mean, when the people want to learn something, they have different mindset. So maybe some people are very determined that they want to learn this. Maybe that's why they go to paid platforms. But some people are like more of, they just want to see how Python looks like. Mm. So they will just go to YouTube and say, oh, Python, okay, first video, awesome. Now this Python, I know about Python. Second video, okay, hello world. Now I know how to run hello world. Third video, addition of two numbers. Okay, now I know how to add, how to add two numbers. And then that's it. I know Python now. So they That's will, enough for they me. Will just to <laughs> enough Python for me. I'm done. Okay. Yeah. That makes Everyone sense. Everyone yeah. requirement to learn. Yeah. Maybe that's why they are dropping out. Yeah. I so. wonder how much of it is because uh, it is free on YouTube. People don't tend to value something that's free. You pay you pay money for a course, you're likely to kind of stick through it and like, okay, I paid this much money, I might as well watch the whole thing. But on YouTube, it's that's free. Right. It's like, ah, I can come back to it later and people don't yeah. follow. Or maybe they, they will even forgot about they have uh, started some series yeah. and then... In fact, when I, I, I bought some of the courses on Udemy, Udemy uh, two years back, and I don't even remember which courses I bought. So every time I go to Udemy, I, I, at least I can see their faces. Okay, this is a course I bought. <laughs> I just have to watch it now. Yeah. So maybe that's something paid platforms gives you. Yeah. That's Consider, true. Maybe that's true. They, they send out reminder emails and all that. So that's, that's yeah. the thing. So maybe you YouTube, should, YouTube should do that. The YouTube, it's actually, I think, is the other way around. You have uh, somebody who is determined to learn Spring or Python. They go to YouTube. What shows up in the recommended feed? It is probably some match highlight video or probably some yeah. movie uh, video. So even if yeah. the person goes to YouTube with good intent, they get distracted by all this crap. Distracted. They go down that rabbit yeah. hole and Java and Python is out of their minds. I have seen that happen with <laughs> myself. So I can empathize yeah. with the viewers who are, who are trying to learn That's on right. YouTube. It's a tricky, right. it's a tricky platform. Um, yeah. I want to ask you about uh, kind of like the accompanying material that you do, either in uh, corporate training or on YouTube or Udemy or whatever else. Like, wh what would you recommend? Like, if you, were, if you were to, if a viewer were coming to you and saying, hey, how would you want me to consume your course? Do you want me to just mm -hmm. watch your videos? Do you want me to do exercises, projects? What would your advice to them be? Okay, now this is a great thing. Uh, you know, so, I, when I was in my college, uh, when I was doing my graduation or maybe post-graduation, I used to believe, you know, just watch the video or just read the book, you understand everything. Because that's what ha is happening in the schools as well. So if you want to know something, just read the book and you're, you're done with that. But then maths is not something you can, you know, you can read and you can learn. And that's, so in my 10th standard, I realized, okay, maths is something you have to practice. And that's why a lot of people hate maths because you have to practice. That's not the case with the history geography. The same thing is carried for programming as well, or any technology for that matter. You can't watch videos and you will know everything. In fact, I have seen people, they just watch the entire series, like let's say Java, Python, Spring, 
and they believe that they know things. They, you don't know things. You just have by hearted the syntax. You have by hearted the flow of the concepts. In fact, uh, I have talked to some of the professionals. They they claim they know Java, and I was like, okay, from where you have learned it? Maybe they have learned it from some different platforms. And the moment they start working on a code, they actually can't code because they know everything. They know about encapsulation. They know how Spring Framework works. They know about how to use uh, JWT in Spring, but they can't code. They can only code those things which are there on YouTube. So let's say they, they watch your video. Now they know how to connect this application with this thing, but how to customize it? Oh, we have to ask Kaushik for that now. So this is something uh, you can't actually watch videos and learn. You have to practice. And not just those things which we have done. So maybe the code which you, in fact, people do that. They watch the content and they also practice. But with that, you have to also practice your own questions. Maybe this is something I was thinking about to give them more assignments. Uh, they can work on those assignments and they can submit the assignments so that I can verify. Mm -hmm. But on YouTube, you can't do that. You know, you will be getting millions of assignments every day. You know, so you can't do that. Yeah. Plus, uh, even when you write a small code, you're not sure if you actually know, know it because writing a small code is very easy nowadays. Even if you go to uh, Google and search for a code, we have this amazing website, uh, Stack Overflow, which gives you everything. Uh, so if you really want to enjoy that, you have to build a project. And that's what I have learned when I made my first project. I, I, I was thinking it was it would be easy. So when I was doing my master's, I was supposed to make a project for uh, for my you know the semesters, and then when I started working on the project, I did, I, I thought it would be a small project, but every day it was expanding. Like you know, I was thinking this will be my project, but then every day I was adding some extra features round and round and round, and at the end it got so big. Even the examiner he was not able to see my entire project. He was like, okay, I got your project, and that's it. So then I realized in those in that you know circle I have learned so many things. And then I got the confidence, OK, now I can work on a project. So you can't actually watch a video and practice small examples just to learn something. Make a project. Maybe a dummy project will do at the start. But try to build a real project with other people's requirement. Because when you have your own requirements, you change your requirements, depend upon the code which is going on. Right. But let's say if you go to NGO, if you talk to your family members, they will be having some project. Uh, they might be needing some software, so you can build that. And that's where you will get the confidence. That's what I always recommend my audience to do. Yeah, no, that's, that, that's so true. Uh, I, I, I've, I've always felt like uh, the skills that we learn in uh, programming is not just about writing code, but also about figuring out when code doesn't work right. It's like, yeah. imagine how much time, like a, a professional software developer, how much time they spend actually typing out the code versus the bulk of time is spent reading the code and also to figure out why the little code that they've typed is not working. It includes searching yeah. Stack Overflow. It includes reading error messages. It includes kind of yeah. anticipating what kind of errors could happen. These are not things that people can learn from in a YouTube video. I've, I've had comments where people have said, oh, this course is great. Now I watched it and I don't have to read a book or read anything else. It's like, no, that's not <laughs> the point. Please do read the book or please do go explore advanced stuff. This is just this is just an yeah. introductory, uh, you know, knowledge. So, yeah, yeah that's, that, right. that, that totally makes sense. Um, and yeah, I think I think we should be adding um, projects and hands on work to video courses. You've yeah. inspired me to do that now. So thank you for that. <laughs> So maybe um, we can do it, do it together. So. Sorry, say that again? Maybe we can do it together on some course. We can, yeah, sure. I'd love to do that. We can definitely check that out. Uh, the, the problem that I see, though, is um, a lot of people who watch my video, I feel, mm. I don't have the data behind this, but based on the questions that they ask and based on kind of like the uh, the interaction, the comments and all that stuff, I get a feeling that a good majority of the people are trying to learn something just to get a job. It's not like there are people who are yeah. in a job and they're trying to level up their skills. It's basically like, okay, I wanna get a job, so I have an interview coming up in a few couple of weeks time, so let me watch as many YouTube videos as possible <laughs> so that I yeah, can get some knowledge. That. Yeah, anything that I can do so that I don't have to actually code to level up the skills. That's something that yeah. I think, uh, you know, it's it might work, it might work in the short term, but it's not a good yeah. long-term strategy, so you don't want to be doing that. 
Um, I do right. want to ask you about the kind of like the job situation. Speaking of jobs, uh, I am. It's been a while since I've been to India and kind of gotten myself familiar with the job market there. Uh, I did spend mm-hmm. a good amount of time writing software in India, but it's it's been a while. So, what are your thoughts about the job market there? Is it is it is it booming? Is it saturated? Is there demand for freshers, people out of college? What do you think about that? So, demand is high till now as well. In fact, a lot of companies they are, have these issues with uh, lay, layoffs now. Uh, in fact, all the services companies they are facing issues recently. Uh, Cognizant also maybe they have uh, they have layoff a lot of people. Uh, the, the main issue which I find is the industry is changing very fast, even in India as well. Of course, India always follow US. What is happening in US now will be happening in India next two, two to three years. And the, the same technology will emerge here as well. But what people don't, they don't understand is they are sticking to technologies which are old. Maybe example, let's say, uh, uh, you know, for the Android market, they are moving from Java to Kotlin. Uh, even Google is promoting Kotlin now, but still people are stick to Java. I'm not saying Java is a bad language. In fact, I'm a Java developer. You know, it always feel bad when you, uh, when some technology replaces Java, but you have to accept the fact, you know, if you want to survive in, in Android, it's time to move from Java to Kotlin. Maybe you can do it parallelly, but also learn Kotlin. <clears throat> then we got Flutter. Now, if you want to make a cross-platform application, of course, you have to learn Flutter. Otherwise, your company will say, hey, we want to make both the apps. And you're not able to do that. So we will, we will need someone who can do it. And then they will kick out of you from the office. And then you then you will say, hey, you know, something is going wrong in India. You will blame the government. You will blame everyone around you. It's your issue, right? You have to update yourself. You can't. This is this is a field where you have to update yourself. And this is something people are not understanding. Some people do understand they have to upgrade, but they're lazy enough to do that. Uh, they have other excuses that they, they just got married. They have kids now. Maybe they want to enjoy their life. Maybe they want to spend their weekend somewhere. I mean, that's fine. If you want to enjoy your life in weekends, do it. But what you're doing in weekdays? Why you're traveling two hours to your office? Change your company, you know? So there, there are ways you can uh, upgrade yourself, but people always find excuse. Why not to learn a new technology? Now for freshers, uh, maybe uh, a lot of people not able to get a job. The employment rate the, uh, is still going down. There are a lot of unemployed. I mean, you can blame engineering colleges. You can blame uh, parents. They are forcing their kids to do engineering till till now as well. Uh, they have some other interest, but you know we have this huge demand for engineers. Uh, on the other hand, you can also blame students. They, I mean, of course, students always blames uh, their college that they don't have good teachers. They don't have uh, good campus placements. See, when I was doing my graduation, even the college from where I did my graduation, we, we were not having any, plas- uh, any placements. Uh, the second teachers were not that great to be proud of. Some people still blame the college that because of the college teachers, they were not able to do something in life. But you have to realize we are not in 1980s where you have, you have to depend upon your teachers, you have to depend upon books. Now it's an open network, right? You can learn anything for free. We have YouTube platform, we have great uh, channels, we have other platforms as well where you can pay around 500 rupees and you can learn the entire course. Maybe you will not everything, you will not learn everything, but at least something to get started. You have to upgrade yourself. You know, you can't simply just by uh, depending on your college scores. And uh, this is uh, with marks as well. Still, a lot of people focus more on marks than skill set. And I have made tons of videos on this. You know, don't focus on your marks. Focus on your skill set. Marks are important, but if you don't have a skill set, no one will hire you. Right. Of course, after two years of experience, no one will ask you, "Hey, what degree you have done, or how much marks you got in your college?" No one will do that. In fact, when I go for corporate training, no one asks my degree. What they ask me is how much experience you have, or can you take this training? That's it. I so think this is something... the computer science field is 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 kind of unique in that sense because you don't see this in other industries. Uh, I think yeah. the reason why college is kind of almost redundant these days is because it's it it's very hard for the academic area to catch up with the advancements in technology, right? The, right? the whole academy, the concept of colleges and syllabus and professors, it's all modeled around the kind of topics uh, like 
uh, you know, the other sciences where things don't change overnight. Here in yeah. computer science, things do change overnight. And the way we have structured uh, the academic curriculum and the process is not meant to handle this. They cannot handle this. Yeah. I mean, I was actually surprised when you said, uh, you know, school kids are taught Python because that would have taken a significant amount of effort to change. The whole system is not yeah. meant for that kind of a change. So, uh, yeah, I think I, I get what you're saying. So do you feel like the, you know, you talked about layoffs. Do you feel like the main reason why that kind of a shift is happening is because uh, you have people still stuck with outdated technology and they're not trying to, you know, get up to date. They're not trying to improve their skills. Do you see that as a major factor? Uh a bit because see if you have that skill set company will not remove you because company never removes the assets they also they always remove the liabilities so they want to re they reduce the liability and they want to increase the number of assets and if you if you are one of them who is getting laid off i'm not saying that's one of the only reason you are laid off because maybe company is going through a very bad phase they have to remove most of the employees or maybe they are closing the entire division of course you can't do anything for that but uh, one of the factors is you don't have that skill set that company thinks that you will add value. Maybe they have given you some choices as well before. Mm. And uh, if that is the reason, then you can blame yourself. Otherwise, uh, in India as well, a lot of companies, they are taking huge risk by hiring freshers and layoffing the senior employees, mm. maybe just to reduce the cost. Because one senior uh, employee will charge 3x of, or 5x of the freshers. Okay. So let's hire five more pressures than one senior. Yeah, that's that's definitely a decision made by a, a corporate person. I can tell. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, um, I I was gonna ask you, uh, Naveen, is there anything you can do about your video? The video is kind of dropping in quality a little bit uh, occasionally. Uh, uh, that... I'm, I'm seeing it, it's not clear from your side. Maybe the network is not that great from my side. Let me just check my. Okay. Is it dropping as well? It's not dropping, but it's super pixelated. Yeah. Okay. Do you have a wired connection or a, wi or a wireless? It's a wireless connection here. Okay. okay I should have been using my desktop. Actually, I'm using laptop to go live. Because the entire setup here is uh -huh. on my laptop. So oh, the green spray and the, the tripod. Okay. So my desktop is sitting somewhere else, which is the editing machine. Okay. I've seen your uh, live content. The, the quality is pretty good. Uh, so oh. I don't know if it's 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 that or something else, but it's it's super duper pixelated. I don't know. Maybe it's Hangouts. That's the problem. Yeah, maybe. Maybe. I was going to talk to you about uh, the kind of um, computer science curriculum that's taught in college. Uh, it's very mm. encouraging to know that uh, kids are being taught Python. Uh, when I was in college, we weren't taught any computer science at all. But uh, okay. if I share more details, I'll give away my age, and I don't want to do that. Uh, the first yeah, I was supposed to ask that. <laughs> <laughs> the the I, I've been told I look young for my age, so I, it's in my best interest yeah. to keep my age a mystery. Um, <laughs> I've, I've been uh, so when I was in um, engineering, right? I did computer science engineering, and the first computer science computer science uh, programming uh, topic subject was uh, programming in Fortran. Okay? okay, so, and that was at the time it was considered like, why are we learning this outdated language, right? Why don't we learn C, which is, which is cool. So <laughs> it's, I'm, I'm happy to hear that it's kind of moved from Fortran to something like Python. It's, 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 it's encouraging. But do you have any sense for like what other topics are taught? for someone like a, a computer science graduate, which might be applicable when they join the job, because I always feel that there is this huge disconnect between someone who comes out of college and then they go join mm -hmm. like a, an MNC or whatever, it's like full on software development, and they don't understand yeah. half the things because they were never taught it. <clears throat> what do you think about okay. that? Okay. Uh, see, I mean, uh, I have seen some of the curriculums of some of the colleges. I got this opportunity to visit uh, some colleges for seminars. In fact, uh, from some of the colleges, I also got the syllabus for the uh, verification or what you say, collections. If they want, I mean, they, they were changing their curriculum, so they have sent me the curriculum to to add something new. Now, when I look, looked at those curriculum, I thought about these things. The first one is some of the colleges, they are not even thinking about changing syllabus. 
I understand the first problem is even if they update the syllabus, who will teach it? They don't have teachers who can upgrade themselves because that's a mindset of most of the uh, college teachers nowadays. They don't want to learn something new. Uh, I mean, they have worked very hard in their in their young age. I mean, they have learned different technologies. Now they are a preacher of a college. Now it's, that's done. That's that's life set for them. They don't want to learn something new to teach. And even if they update a syllabus with a new subject or a new topic, no one is there to teach. Mm. <clears throat> the second issue is even if you change your syllabus, what changes you are making? Of course, you want to introduce new technologies, but the question is, what new technologies? Will it be something which is there will, will be there for a long time, or it's something which is short? Example: One of the college they have introduced a new subject which is Android, but then Android with uh, what was that? What hey Kiran? What was the technology name? Android for uh, cross platform. Okay, there was some technology which is. Uh, I forgot the name. So before Flutter, before React came into picture, mm -hmm. Cordova, right? Cordova. Yeah. So there's a there was a Cordova, technology yes. Cordova. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So they were teaching Cordova in college. Now the question is, you thought about changing your syllabus? Great. You thought about teaching them Android? Great. You're th you're thinking about teaching them Cordova. The first problem is not everyone is interested in Android. Second, even if you're thinking about Android, why are you teaching something which will be there for short term? Of course, right? I mean, you they are they doing a four-year degree and you are teaching them Kodawa. Maybe it will it is not it will not be applicable for next two years after two years. I'm not seeing people working on Kodawa now. They are working on React, they're working on uh, Flutter. Mm -hmm. So if you're changing your syllabus, change something which will be there for long term. Example, let's say machine learning, it makes sense because that's a future. Blockchain makes sense because most of the technology will move towards blockchain. Maybe cloud computing makes sense because everything is running on cloud now. But Cordova, I mean, you have to think before choice, changing yes. your curriculum. Yeah. Yeah. The next thing is the change which they are making is the new technology. Uh, in fact, I have seen some of the colleges, they have introduced machine learning. It's a great thing. They are teaching machine learning. But the question is, who is teaching it? Are you, uh, you know, having some industry experts teaching machine learning? Because this is not something which can be learned by someone who is not interested in machine learning. Because what happens in colleges is they rotate their subjects. So I have seen in some of the colleges. So this year, if, they are, if you are teaching Java, next year you will teach, let's say Python. Next year gotcha. you will teach database. Yeah. If the same person is teaching machine learning next year, this person don't know machine learning. What he will do, he will read the book. He will teach machine learning. And basically, you are killing the excitement of machine learning <laughs> for students. So yeah. that's one of the issues which I feel. I mean, if you want to new, if you want to teach new technology, at least spend some more money which you're taking from your students mm -hmm. on experts. I mean, of course, the fees is so high; they are charging around one lakh rupees or one point five lakh rupees per student. Can't you invest one percent of it on industry experts who can talk about new technologies? Yeah, I wonder where that money goes for, especially for something like computer science you got to treat the subject differently because you don't have to have yeah. expensive labs for computer science, for example, right? The mechanical engineers yeah. needs this big machines and the money goes there. What do you need That's for right. computer science? You don't even need PCs. You can set up terminals which SSH into a yeah. main box and then you can have people code there. So right. where is that money going if not investing in good teachers? I don't get that. But I, that's I just, why we need blockchain to have all the records. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, I have to ask you about blockchain, but we'll get to that in a bit. Um, <laughs> but I also feel like you know we talked earlier about how you know the the system isn't designed for these kind of changes, right? It's I can empathize with a computer science professor saying, "Well, now I have to learn this this new thing," while the mechanical professor is out there watching a movie. He doesn't have to learn anything. It's the yeah. same same stuff he's been teaching for years, right? I don't know That's if right. this is true. Maybe mechanical engineering also changes. So my apologies to whoever is <laughs> mechanical engineering and watching this video if that's not true. But yes, it is yeah. It is an extra burden to being a computer science engineer. So it does need more funds. It needs more research. It needs better staffing. And uh, it also needs fewer, uh, lesser investment in terms of infrastructure. So there is a balance yeah. there. So yeah, uh, hopefully the situation will change, but I believe that's kind of like a common problem. It's not just in India, right? I'm sure it's this is the yeah. same problem all across the world. So I guess um, 
the moral of the story is if someone is uh, graduating from college they cannot rely on what they learned in college right the academic knowledge yeah, is only going to get them so far they have to ramp up on their own and you know yeah. thankfully we live in a in an age where all of that is easily accessible so just go to youtube and do your searches you will find hundreds and hundreds of videos these days so that should be uh, but there's a confusion right in fact uh, they are not sure what to learn now mm-hmm. so they always ask me in live sessions i've done my engineering now what what technology should learn right yeah. uh, does javascript as a future just does the blockchain as a future yeah so maybe that we need to have that path as well yeah so. yeah that's that's a hard question to answer like what is the future uh, for someone who is who is picking from like 10 different technologies for you and i it's yeah. the path is kind of set right so any major change we make we can kind of make an informed decision but for someone who's yeah. fresh who has nothing starting from a clean slate there are so many different options where do they start from it is it is a challenge so it is yeah but it is reality right there's really no way around it people have to make a decision if if someone and comes they, to us they, yeah. sorry go ahead no, go go ahead. so i said if someone comes to us with a with a question like that it's hard for us to answer like if i've had people come to me and say should i go for the javascript stack or the java stack is like how can i how can anybody answer that it's very very hard it depends on the opportunities that you have around you depends on your interest yeah. level what you want to achieve it's it's hard question in fact the best thing is if they join a company and if the project is in javascript that's great you don't have to think about those things right you yeah. know you have to work on javascript you have the entire stack on javascript but what if you are not working in a company you are a freelancer or you want to you are searching for a job and they directly ask me hey should i go for javascript the same question should i go for javascript or should i, should I go for java mm. and we can't answer that because if you say because see we are always biased towards technology which we love of course we will say hey go for java is great but then what if that person will not enjoy java maybe yeah. back of the the way their mind works is more for javascript uh, right so basically we are you know we are not giving the right uh, track yeah. to them yeah we don't want to give people advice that they hate and they're going to come back to me and like look what you made me do now yeah. i hate this thing i spent 6 <laughs> months learning what you suggested and now i hate it yeah, yeah it's it, it's a hard it's a hard thing to give advice on so yeah. speaking of uh, people preparing for interviews and then picking a technology to take up interviews i have a related question there around tackling interviews right uh, what in your experience has been some of the uh, the good things that people do when they tackle interviews what are the bad things the the common mistakes that people make like if you were to give advice to people who are tackling interviews and preparing for it uh, what would some advice be uh yeah so the good thing so let me not talk about the communication because of course there are a lot of videos available there are a lot of content available in fact colleges they are focusing on how can we improve your communication for interviews and how can you convince them in fact really? i feel this you know interview is more about are, are they seriously yeah, like colleges are, going down that's amazing i didn't know that yeah. wow. the campus placement so every college now they have a campus uh, placement cell where every weekend they i mean i'm talking about some of the colleges every weekend they have a session only for the interviews how to uh, crack interviews okay so let me get this straight they're taught how yeah. to communicate in interviews but not how to level up their communication in general <laughs> that's right that's right. that's a little weird you know imagine somebody clearing an interview getting a job and their communication skill is like okay what happened now it's like i would start just to talk in an interview <laughs> not to talk on the job <laughs> that's super weird okay but it's Maybe good that they're doing it so talk to us yeah it's it's at least good that they're doing it i think there is some commonality between communication uh in interviews and in the job in general so yeah. it's 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 a good thing so sorry continue please yeah so they so they they teach you how to talk to interviewers how to answer the question because uh-huh. there are some tricky questions as well right right uh, i mean why why we should hire you so they have uh-huh. they give they give you the exact answer so for this question you have to answer this this way okay uh, they also because even interviews they are not changing their questions nowadays they are they stick to those uh, old school questions uh, that's that's the first thing next i want to focus more on the technical part so based on the company which we which you go for of course everyone have, will have a different set of questions uh, thankfully in the development world people used to ask java questions before i mean irrespective of what type of uh, platform you are going to go on maybe you will work on javascript or python or dotnet still the question will be based on java because maybe the interviewers they don't know the technologies 
Uh, so they will ask you questions on Java, about this and that. Now, one thing which is going good about for students is they are preparing well for the interviews before going. They're not just going, I mean, getting up in the morning and say, hey, we have an interview today. Let's dress up properly and go for the interviews. They are preparing for the interview from, let's say, for 15 days. Now they know for which question, how to answer, and what to answer. If this is a question which is very, you know, what do you say, common question, of course they can answer. But there are some questions which they have to understand that there is not a part of a curriculum. Let me share one experience. I was, uh, so there was a girl, she went for the interview and she was, she has prepared very well for the interview. I mean, they, she learned about uh, Java, about networking and all the concepts which normally ask in the, question, in the interviews. But in one of the interview, the question was, uh, do you know firewall? And her reaction was, how would I know firewall? You know, in, in Hindi, the answer was, Kya tha ke college mein? So that, that's the issue. You know, they depend more on the college syllabus than they depend upon uh, the internet technology. Because if you are working in the IT world, you can't say that this is something out of syllabus. Of course, right, if you're if you if you're a French doctor and he's into some other uh, practice, uh, you know, practice. He's not uh, the practice which you are looking for. Let's say you are, you got some burn on your hand and now you're showing it to a doctor. Of course, it's not. there's no compulsion that that person is a dermatologist, right? Uh, but still, he has to answer that thing. Otherwise, you will be having this thing. I mean, why you have done your degree? Same goes for IT professionals, right? So the if doctor you, can say out of syllabus know, in that case, right? Yeah. yeah. So same thing goes for you. So in interview, they might ask you any, any question. And that's something you have to prepare well. The negative thing, negative thing, which you, in fact, you have answered that before. Some people watch our videos just for interview. So they have an interview tomorrow and they want, the, the interview is based on, on Python or maybe on Spring. So they will watch the entire series and they go for the interviews and they will answer. They have this amazing, uh, you know, because what you say, grasping power because they have done in your, their schools by hearting everything. And the moment they have a question, they will answer that. In fact, this is something I got a comment recently. Uh, I was teaching some concept I don't remember now. And that concept, I tried to explain so that you will understand. The same thing, if you, you can't do that in the interview. So they have by heart the entire phrase and they have given the same answer in the interview and then he got rejected. Of course, I'm teaching you. I'm not giving interview here. So you can't use my sentence in the interviews. Uh, so that's the bad thing they are doing. Anything else I can pick up is, and one of the things which should people do nowadays is uh, participating in hackathons, working on open source project, because a lot of people are not doing it, uh, especially the place where I live in Mumbai. In Bangalore, it's an awesome thing. In Bangalore, every college knows what hackathons are, how to participate in hackathons. But in Mumbai, colleges, they don't even know what hackathons are. And I mean, some, some people know, some colleges do hackathons, but I feel everyone should participate at least once just to get the experience, just to get the feel of it. And it will help. It will be very helpful for your interviews. It will be helpful for your projects as well. Cool. Cool. That's, that's, that's some great tips. It's a, I, I wish more people take on uh, personal projects. That's something yeah. that I, I keep telling people. Just pick some problem that you want to solve, even if there are like 10 different applications which do that already. Uh, just pick yeah. a personal project and apply the work that you've done. It doesn't have to be an official college project. Nobody's going to grade right. you or whatever else. Just just do it on your own accord. Uh, that's that's going right. to teach you more about any technology than anything else. Mm -hmm. um, what are your thoughts about some of the... Um, some of the newer uh, technologies that are coming up. So you have uh, you're you're working on blockchain, which is which is pretty niche at this point. It's not something that's mm -hmm. gained wide acceptance. Uh, I'm sure you must have been bombarded with uh, comments about artificial intelligence and machine learning and all that stuff. Uh, I, I yeah. see that a lot as well. So what are your thoughts about someone getting into those kind of like niche areas right now? Is this something that's uh, that you would recommend? for someone new to software? Or do you say, okay, wait for a bit, let's see if this develops and then we can get into it. What are your thoughts about that? Uh, I mean, yeah, of course, I can I can be biased here a bit. <laughs> so, 
<laughs> so every time I go live on YouTube, every time I talk to in colleges, in fact, they have this common question. Uh, I mean, of course, they first want me to make videos on machine learning, which I will never do, at least in the next three to four years, because I'm not into machine learning. And I don't want to make a series just because you're demanding. I, mean, I did that for Python, but machine learning is something which where you need expertise. Uh, now, the second point is, uh, will I suggest someone to get into machine learning or blockchain? That depends, actually. So if let's say if you are to be, on, to be on the bias side, of course, I will say everyone learned blockchain because that's the future. Yeah, because of course, right, if, if you're working on a technology, you will be always biased for, for that technology and you always feel it is a great future. Mm -hmm. And that's something I feel for blockchain. It has a very great future because it's a technology which will change the way you work on the internet. But the only problem is it's new. It's not actually new. It's been 10, it's been 10 years blockchain is there. It's been but 10 years, really? It, it, I didn't know that. I yes, think it recently became popular. Right. Yeah. So blockchain came because of Bitcoin. Uh, it's underlying technology of Bitcoin. And when Bitcoin was launched, blockchain was there. But people were not, not able to realize the power of it. Uh, so in 2014, they officially named it blockchain. Initially, it was chain of blocks. I see. But in 2014, they have renamed it to, I mean, there was a conference in which they have named it finally. Uh, Thank God they renamed blockchain. Imagine someone saying, what are you working on? I'm working on chain of blocks. Chain of blocks. <laughs> that sounds so bad. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. Blockchain cool, sounds interesting. Cool, right? Okay. Uh, and because of all this uh, uh, efforts from different companies, like, you know, we got uh, Intel, we got uh, IBM. They are also, you know, giving their, their products to, for, for the blockchain. Mm -hmm. But will it be applicable for freshers? There's a, still a question because... When you join a company, now companies are not hiring freshers for blockchain because for them it's a new technology. Of course, you will not get people who are experienced in blockchain because the technology is new for the market. But then if you have experience in some other technology and now if you have learned blockchain, at least you have the industry experience. So companies are preferring those people who have industry experience plus they have, they have learned blockchain or they have certified in blockchain. Uh, even when you're certified in blockchain, it's still a question because Blockchain certifications are still a mess. You can simply go to online. You can do a course, and you can, you can give exam online. You can cheat. So, uh, certification does not make any sense for blockchain, but still, okay. uh, people prefer those people who I mean, companies prefer those people who have learned blockchain, but they also have industry experience. But if you're fresh from the market, if you're fresh to the market, if you're from college, they might not. They might not prefer you. But again, that's the thing. They might not. But what if they want someone fresher who want to work on blockchain? I've seen some companies, some startups, they are preferring freshers because they have a more open mindset. Because experienced people, they have this thing. You know, they want to do. They want to work in their own way. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't want to listen to the managers. They don't want to. They want to be a boss there. But yeah. freshers, they are open to everything. They are like, okay, give me a technology. I will learn it. I will implement something new. Mm -hmm. They they want that energy. So. It depends upon you. If you are sure that you can master in blockchain, uh, it's not something you have you have watched my videos, some of my videos, and say, "Hey, I know blockchain now." That's that's not how it works. You need to work on some projects on blockchain. If you can do that, it's a great technology. Hmm. Apply for the job and build your career. But just by watching some videos on on blockchain, or maybe my, watching some videos on machine learning, I've seen some people they just watch some machine learning videos and they call themselves as machine learning experts. That's not you, how you will get higher. But if you if you know that you can build projects on machine learning, you can build projects on blockchain. <clears throat> if you are confident, that's great. Apply for the job. You will surely there will be some company who will hire you. And don't think about packages. I've seen a lot of people when they join company, they have this mindset. I want at least uh, X package. See, when you are a fresher, doesn't matter which technology you join, which technology you're working on. Don't think about packages. Think about how much you can learn in one or two years. Because initially, if you think about learning, later you can remove that L. You can think about earning. But at initial one or two years, focus only on learning part. And yes, uh, <clears throat> you can learn machine learning. You can, do, uh, you can do blockchain at the initial stage. But here's the thing. If you're not sure that you can actually learn new technologies, if you're not that excited, don't take a risk now. Go with the technology which are still there in the market, which is running on the cream layer, let's say Android, cloud computing, uh, Spring. So learn those technologies. 
get a job. Now, while working on your job, look at the project which is happening on your in, inside your company. By any chance, if you feel there's a project which is going on blockchain and they're doing POC, and you have learned blockchain, some of the videos, some of my videos, great. Continue with the course now. I mean, continue with some other course which you want to learn from and try to connect with that team and show them your skill set. Of course, they will take you because you have shown your abilities in the other projects and they are ready to take you. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the way you can jump from uh, your field to blockchain or, or machine learning. Right. Are there jobs though in blockchain? Like, is it is it something that uh, people can look for? Like, I'm searching for a job in blockchain. Like, do they get opportunities that way? Uh, for big companies, they are not looking for freshers. Yeah. I mean, they have blockchain jobs, but they are not looking for freshers. They're they are looking, looking for, for someone freshers. who has industry experience. Yeah. Plus, they know blockchain. But there are some startups. They are looking for blockchain. I mean, they are looking for employees who can work on blockchain. But these startups are very very startup i mean they're into start of the startup phase <laughs> yeah uh, so it will be a risk for you when you join these companies okay. because yeah. um, of course if you, if that company works you will be the top five employees but then what if it doesn't work out exactly so that's the thing that's always a risk so wait for one or two thing. years yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah but the technology you should know though i mean it's something you can learn i mean work on spring work on cloud computing work on android but have this thing, this skill set with you. You never know when the opportunity will knock. Maybe mm -hmm. your company will say, hey, we have a new project. Anyone knows blockchain? And you'll be like, okay, I've done some projects. Yeah, so. yeah. yeah, that makes sense, that makes sense. It's always important to have the breadth and knowledge, especially when you're a fresher. Yeah. Uh, you, need, you need to know what's going on, like what are the different technologies so that when the opportunity does come, you can, like you said, you can kind of pounce on it. Um, yeah, that's we are we are close to the end of time, uh, Naveen. I want to end with one last question. Uh, I want to ask you sure, about sure. some of your uh, upcoming work. Uh, you said mm -hmm. you are uh, not going to make any content on machine learning, which is a bit of a disappointment. I would have definitely been interested to check it out. But can you talk about what content you are doing? What can the viewers expect from you in the foreseeable future? Okay, great. Uh, so specific to Navin Reddy, I'll be publishing course on blockchain, uh, mm -hmm. both on YouTube and on a paid, paid platform. Now, why not everything on YouTube? Because not everyone is interested to know about blockchain. I don't want to bombard the YouTube channel with blockchain videos. So I want to focus on those things which people really want on YouTube. Mm -hmm. And the blockchain hyperledger courses will be there on the paid platform, which is the discord.com. Uh, but then, because of the huge demand for machine learning, what what I'm doing is I'm doing collaboration. So, one of uh, I'm talking to one of the company. They will be making content on machine learning and will be publishing on our platform. But again, the same thing. People, uh, I mean, subscribers who love my channel, they want everything to be taught by Navin Reddy. So I tried this with JavaScript as well. But every JavaScript video have this comment, which is Navin Reddy. So which is <laughs> why Navin is not teaching this. I mean, the trainer was awesome, but then still, once they like you, I mean, of course, your audience, when they watch your spring videos, uh, maybe those people are dislike my videos, you know? <laughs> no, not I the way, don't think so. I, don't not think so. I, think we have a, I think we share a lot of uh, common <laughs> audience there, so I don't, I don't think, I yeah. don't think so, but yeah. Um, so you're, you're working on blockchain content, uh, and yes. you do have that expertise, so that's, that sounds exciting. Uh, and this is available on telesquare.com. So people have to sign yes. a, create an account there and, and purchase. Yes. What about your yes. YouTube content? What are, what are some things that uh, people can look forward to on YouTube? Uh, they can focus there. I mean, there are, of course, blockchain videos, but the entry level blockchain videos, which okay. will be beneficial for everyone, uh, not to get to master in that, but to understand how blockchain works. That's my first target. The second one is I want to make some more videos on Python because after watching, when I made Python, I was not having a lot of expectations from the uh, from those videos. But then uh, the videos are getting millions of views now. And uh, people are expecting a lot from me. Every day, uh, they ask me to make more advanced videos on Python. But I was ignoring them. It's time. I should make some more videos on Python. And I want to make some more videos on Java as well because it's been a long time. The, the, the thing is, there's so many things on, on the list, uh, but the only problem is the bandwidth. I don't have that much of time. Yes. yes. I can also blame I'm lazy. 
<laughs> maybe I, and uh, I just uh, so I have a two years kid so okay uh, two two uh, two months or two years two months so. okay that's rough <laughs> okay so you 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 yeah. cannot be lazy if you have a two month old kid uh, but no it's yeah. um it, it's a story of my life too uh, with too much of too much of content in the to do list and not enough time. And I'd like to think that I'm not lazy. Maybe I'm lying to myself. So let me assure you that it's not it's not laziness. It's just the nature of uh, nature of creating content. And it's okay. it's it's been great talking to you. And I don't usually interact with a lot of other content creators, uh, but I want to change that. And I'm so glad that you responded. It was great to kind of talk to you and. Not a lot of people realize the amount of effort that goes into making this content, making it available on YouTube, making sure it's errors, error proof, right? You got to make sure there are no errors, spelling mistakes, factual mistakes yeah. and all that stuff. It, there is a lot of work that goes into it. So I'm, I'm really glad to be, have the opportunity to talk to another content creator like yourself and we can share the pain, share the joys and the sorrows. So thank you so much yeah. for taking the time to do this. Yeah, that pain part was important. Sharing pain, <laughs> even oh, I yeah, realized yeah, a yeah, lot yeah. of things from your side. I'd, I'd be happy. To, I'd be happy to share more pain with you, <laughs> but I don't know if you'd want to take it. But so, um, yeah, it's it, it's it's been great talking to you, and uh, I hope that we continue to talk. Sure, sure. All right. Thanks, Bye. Naveen. Bye bye.